All right. So let's go ahead and get started. Hi, uh, aloha. My name is Connie. I am an admissions counselor here for the University of Hawaii Manoa. And today's Warrior webinar is about, is all for non-resident applicants. So if you are not from the state of Hawaii and you are not a Wubi student or you live um, uh, west of the Rockies, then you are uh, considered a non-resident. And um, I will show you the list of states if you're not sure about the division, um, but that I'll show you that in a little bit later. So um, this is a live webinar. I'm actually here talking to you live. So what is great about that is that you can ask any questions that you have. So the agenda today is I'll be going over a presentation about the university, who we are, uh, what you can do here, what you can do at Manoa, our admissions requirements, and then scholarship opportunities. Um, and then after that, the rest of the time will be held uh, for Q&A. So if you do have a question, you'll be able to type it into the Q&A tab of Zoom. Uh, throughout the presentation, if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to type it in the, in the Q&A, and then I'll get to that after I'm done uh, presenting, and that'll be the first few questions that I ask. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So the University of Hawaii Manoa is located on the island of Oahu. So I'm not sure if any of you have gone to um, our islands before, our state, but so if we're off the coast of California, if you go right here to the island of Oahu, um, I do know a lot of people have visited Big Island and we do have a campus. Um, the UH system does have a campus on the Big Island, but we are separate. So I just wanna make that clear, Manoa is on the island of Oahu here. So this is where Manoa is. We are in Honolulu and we are uh, roughly, oops, we are about 15 minutes away from Diamond Head and Waikiki. So Waikiki would be on the opposite side of Diamond Head here. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my mouse. Um, so some students ask, you know, how close are you to the coast? And we're about 15 minutes away from the coast. Um, the neighborhood of Manoa itself is fairly quiet and fairly um, safe. It is sandwiched in between residential areas and other schools. And so we're just on the outside of Manoa Valley. Manoa Valley does go up all the way into the mountain. So if you picture Hawaii to be, you know, tropical rainforest, then, you know, that's upper Manoa for you. If you think of Hawaii and you think, you know, it's a pretty busy city, um, then, you know, just drive, um, about five minutes anywhere and then you'll hit, you know, bigger city life. So um, the campus is in a very convenient location for students um, academically and um, socially to get acclimated to the new state. Um, so our campus is about 320 acres, which is, you know, fairly large. Uh, we are a medium sized school and our whole campus is actually an arboretum. So we have, you know, thousands of different species of plants uh, plant life on our campus, so it's very nice to walk through. Um, hopefully after COVID, you'll be able to schedule a campus tour. Not yet, but it will, it will, will we resume that soon um, once COVID is all done. All right, so that's enough about where we are and who, um, where our school is. So next we're going to talk about who the students are. Okay, so we are a state school. So we do get a lot of in-state students coming um, to our school. And in the previous slide, I showed you the island chain that the state of Hawaii is made up of. So um, we don't have students just coming from our island. We do have students coming from all islands of Hawaii um, to make up that about two thirds coming from in-state. About one third, uh, the remaining one third comes from the continental US or here in Hawaii, we refer to it as the mainland. Um, so um, within this one third percentage, we do get a big portion of students coming from California or more Western states, but we do have a lot of students coming from, you know, East Coast side. One of my uh, best friends in undergrad uh, came from Philly. So, you know, we do get a lot of um, East Coast students um, handful of my friends in undergrad were from New Jersey too. So um, I do believe we have one person here from Texas. So um, we do, you know, we get students coming from all over as well as all over the world too because of our 6% international rate. So um, within the 6%, you can actually see over a hundred different countries and regions 
representatives. So if diversity is something that is important to you, or if you like learning about new cultures and you like um, you know, learning and exploring different things, then this campus would be uh, something you know, really great to offer you. You can walk around campus and you can hear several languages being spoken. Um, and I'll go into the, the academic programs in a bit, but since we're on the topic of languages, uh, we are one of the schools in the nation that offer the most language programs. So you can actually choose from about 20 different languages to, um, to study. And depending on your major, it might be required that you do um, take two years of a foreign language. So you have a big selection to um, choose from, or you can be like me and choose a couple um, if you're curious. Um, so I did say that we're medium sized and that was in, um, in regard to our enrollment numbers. So we are just under 18,000 and this includes undergraduates and graduates. If you're wondering about our undergraduates, um, we are about 12,000 um, students large. And the class size ratio, this will, you know, this will vary depending on what your class standing is and what classes you're taking. Typically freshmen and sophomores are taking the lower division prerequisite courses. And, um, you know, those are large lecture classes that can hold up to 300 students. Uh, but if you do have a large lecture class, they will also supplement that with smaller lab courses um, that's incorporated into the class. And so you'll be meeting in sections of about 20 students per one TA or per one instructor. So af averaging all of that comes out to about 13 to one. And we do have over 100 different bachelor programs that you can major in. I'll be talking about a few in this next slide. So if you are interested in you know, studying anything in regards to land, sea, space, or solar, or renewable energy, then we are a great university for you. We are a research one institution designated by the Carnegie Institute of Research, and um, colleges can have two rankings, uh, tier one or tier two, and we are, we are given the ranking of tier one. So if you're interested in research, you know, there's a lot of opportunities here for you. Research is ingrained into the curriculum. So for a lot of courses, you'll actually have um, maybe at the your final semester project will be a research paper or a group research paper. Um, there are some majors, I mean, you can do research in all fields, but perhaps some fields an internship might be more um, applicable or more preferred. And so we do have a lot of internships as well. Um, there are a few majors on campus where you actually are required to do some kind of career-based capstone or an internship before you can graduate with that major. So uh, research or internships, we have a lot of opportunities here to supplement your academic um, growth. Um, if you're interested in business, we actually rank top 16 in the nation for our international business program. Um, our business college is called Scheidler. Great, great opportunities coming from Scheidler. Um, and then we, if you're interested in astronomy or physics, we rank 12th in the nation for our, our um, physics and astronomy program. We're very strong. And actually, um, a lot of our um, faculty and students make a lot of news. So just recently, um, I believe a visiting professor that was using uh, the university's resources um, at the observatory actually won a Nobel, Peace, uh, Nobel Peace Prize, excuse me. So, you know, we have great facilities if you're interested in those topics. All right, so things that you can do at Manoa, we do have a very rich campus life and campus culture. Um, I was a student at Manoa, and so, um, you know, I can attest, you know, there's so much to do on campus. There's so many different ways to make friends on campus and build those connections. So some of those things would be, um, so the gym is actually new. When I was an undergrad, it wasn't ready. Um, it was still being built when I was in college. Um, so the, the gym, it's also called the Warrior Rec Center. It is huge. It's two stories. There's over a hundred different cardi machines. If just running on one treadmill isn't enough, you can run on over 100 different treadmills if you wanted to. Um, there's also a basket, a full size basketball court that can be converted into a volleyball court. Um, above the court, there's an indoor track. That one is smaller. Um, typically, four laps make a mile, but on this indoor track, because it is smaller, 13 laps make a mile. That's a little too much counting for me, so I just prefer one of the cardio machines. Um, but that's um, one thing that you can do. 
And what is great about that is it's right in the center of campus. And a lot of students will intentionally or unintentionally um, have breaks in between classes. So let's say you have two classes and then you have maybe a one or two hour break and then you have class again. Um, so you could definitely go to the gym, work out or sign up for one of their fitness classes and then go shower in the locker rooms, be nice and fresh for your next class. So it makes it really convenient to kind of combat that freshman 15. Um, in addition to the gym, we do have a lot of different intramural sports that are offered each semester. I believe it's different sports that are offered each semester. And we do have a leisure center. Um, it's not called the leisure center. Um, it's called the Student Recreational Services, um, SRS, but leisure center sounds easier um, and it's faster. So in that office, you can actually sign up for classes that are outdoors. So if you're new to the island, and you want to explore with maybe a couple of your friends and you've never been to this hike before or you want to learn how to surf, um, there are those kinds of classes that you can pay for a small fee. It will in include, you know, maybe a, the, the guide or the instructor, the equipment needed and transportation. So it's really convenient and definitely something that I used when I was attending Manoa as an undergraduate. Uh, we also have, a, uh, we are very big into theater. So each semester there's at least one big production. I believe a few years ago, um, the last one that I attended uh, was a Midnight Summer's Dream, uh, a Midnight Summer's Bollywood Dream. So it was very cool, they incorporated um, Eastern and Western influences. And that's what we're known for, for our theater program, because we are right in the middle of East and West. So you'll see a lot of those influences in you know, our food and class topics, discussions in the courses, as well as theater. Um, in addition to that, we have over, you know, almost, uh, we're at almost 300 student clubs. And at Manoa, we call it RIOs, the acronym is here, Registered Independent Organizations. And so, you know, we have a whole bunch of different ones, you know, some are career based, some are professional development, some is community service based, and some is just personal interest or hobby. So there's a lot you can do. Uh, for example, um, I created my own club. Um, you're allowed to do that. I made something called the Tom's Club. I don't know if you remember what Tom's are, um, but they were a brand of shoe where if you buy one, it sends, uh, the, the makers would send a pair of shoes to student, uh, children in need in Africa. And so you can make your own college club to one, uh, uh, sorry, make funds to send over um, for those productions. So I made my own club there. I learned a lot. I learned how to um, draft a grant proposal. I learned how to present um, to get funds for the club so that you can afford um, some swag items and promotional things. Um, there's also a Nicki Minaj fan club that was not part of um, the club list when I was there. Um, they have a LARPing club, um, there's community service, there's a bunch of different national honor societies that you can be invited to join. Um, so there's a lot of different ways and this is actually how students will make friends is by joining clubs, going to the athletics games, getting involved. And then we do have a very strong productions and media um, group and so there's a bunch of different ones. If you're interested in radio, we have a, a radio broadcasting program that you can DJ in. We do have a newspaper called The Kaleo. Uh, we have a web scene. We have a bunch of different things. So a lot of ways to get involved and in just doing something for fun. You can actually write all of those into your CV or your resume because those, those practical job life skills. So really, really good opportunities here. Okay, so as I mentioned, you know, going to the sporting games, um, is a really big thing, especially because the state of Hawaii doesn't have our own like national league, like we don't have our own NBA team, we don't have a team in the NFL. Um, and so the UH Manoa sports really gets it like captures the state's um, um, attention and those are our fans. Um, so if you go to the games, they're almost always filled. It's just, the crowd is really excited and it's just a fun time. And they do a lot of uh, themed nights. So um, I think one of our students is a tour guide and he was telling me they had a Star Wars theme for a volleyball game. And the first like 200 students got a free lightsaber. And he said that it was pretty legit. Um, and it was, you know, it was pretty nice. He and his roommate played Star Wars afterwards. So they do a lot of uh, giveaways and they have a t-shirt cannon and all that good stuff, dance cam. 
um, crowd competitions during halftime. So this is a lot of fun. And as students, this is free to attend. Um, you just show your student ID card and then you can go into any home game for free. And we are division one. So if you're wondering, are we D1 or D2? If you're thinking about you know, auditioning for sports, we, we do play in the division one. Okay, so things that you can do um, at Manoa that takes you outside of Manoa is that you can study abroad, you can do exchange programs. So there's a lot of different ways to do an exchange, whether it's with a group setting or a one-on-one -on -one individual kind of um, uh, exchange program. And there are over 160 different partner universities throughout the world. We have it in Asia, in Australia, some parts of Africa, Europe, um, South America. So almost all the continents, you know, not Antarctica yet, maybe, um, but almost all the, all the continents. So lots to do. And I would say a good majority of our students do actually um, study abroad at one point in time um, in their um, college careers. And I have seen um, a couple of our students in the office have actually studied abroad twice. So as long as you are smart about it and you work with your um, major advisor and you go over courses, make sure that you're on track and that you're taking the right courses at the foreign um, university, then the credits will transfer over and it won't push your graduation back any. So, um, you know, two birds with one stone, there's a lot of ways you can do that at Manila. Okay, into housing. So living on campus is not required, but it is highly recommended, especially for students coming from afar, from our non-resident students. So if you are incoming freshmen and you are coming from out of state, you are given the highest priority for housing as long as you apply before the deadline, which is May 1st. You can apply for housing after you are accepted because you need your UH ID number to submit the application. So once you're accepted, um, apply for housing, get that submitted before May 1st, and then you can, um, yeah, you can get that in. Um, if you're wondering about housing, these circular towers here, this is the freshman tower. So only freshmen and their RAs live here. It's one RA per floor. And each tower, I believe, houses 216 students. Um, each floor has a bathroom, uh, two, two bathrooms, um, not community style. So it's all separate, which is important for some people. Um, um, every other floor has a student lounge. And the top floor has a big student lounge slash living room. It has a full kitchen. Um, although if you are a freshman and you live in the freshman towers, a meal plan is included in the cost of housing. And so you don't need to cook your own meals, but if you wanted to like bake cookies or something and you don't have a baking sheet, you can go down to the lobby and rent out um, those kind of materials and then um, bake or cook up in the roof. And then it's a almost 360 wraparound balcony or lanai at the roof. So uh, you get really nice diamond head views on this side and really nice sunset views on this side. So um, because it is pretty high up, it is a high rise. Um, I believe it's uh, 12 floors, uh, I believe, or 16. Um, uh, we are an island, so there's a lot of trade winds. Um, so it's very breezy. So these buildings do not have an AC, but you don't need an AC because you get a lot of wind. Uh, because it is a circle, all the rooms are on the outskirts of the circle and the core is where the bathrooms, the lounge and the elevators are. So every room gets a window. Okay, so now the good stuff, probably the thing that you came here most to learn about is our admissions requirements. So how can you get in? How can you become a rainbow warrior? Okay, so our application for fall, if you are a senior right now, our application is open right now for you. So you can go ahead and apply. It would, if you um, want a screenshot or take a picture, this will be offered again on the last slide that I show you, but this is our main page. And if you scroll down, it will give the option. The first tab says freshman, the second tab says transfer. So you can choose which one is most applicable to you. Um, and then, you know, it will take you to right to the application. And so we do have two deadlines if you're looking to start school in August, you know, the, which follows the typical school year. So the priority deadline is January 5th and the final deadline is March 1st. So um, if you are considering scholarships and for, you know, for this group being non-resident, your tuition is a bit higher than you know, in-state. And so I highly recommend that you apply before this January 5th priority deadline that way you will be in good um, timing 
so you'll, you'll be accepted sooner and then you can be ahead of the scholarship deadlines. Um, I'll talk more about scholarships in the next three slides um, from now, uh, but scholarship deadlines do happen, you know, March 1st or earlier, but one of those you have to be accepted in order to access the database. So definitely you want to apply before the priority deadline. Just put yourself in a good position. Okay, so the requirements, what you would need to apply. Um, so as long as you follow your high school's curriculum, we've set up our freshman course requirements to reflect, you know, what the typical high school curriculum um, credits would fulfill. And so as long as you follow that, you should meet our requirements. Um, so, you, you know, your typical four years of English, uh, three years of math, uh, we prefer you get up to geometry, so algebra one, two, and geometry. Three years or units of science, like a lab science, and we recommend biology, chemistry, and physics. Um, especially if you're going into something, um, a major related to STEM, you want to prepare yourself uh, for, you know, the rigor of the classes that you'll be taking. Um, social science, three units. A lot of students will ask, what does other college prep and these electives mean? So, you know, your core classes are English, math, science, and, you know, social studies or some kind of social science. Those are your core classes. And then you do take electives in high school. You do take other courses like foreign language. You can take AP courses. You can take additional math courses. So this other college prep is anything that's in excess of these for course um, types, if that makes sense. So let's say you take a fourth year of math. Well, we only require three, so that fourth year of math will count toward one of your four college prep classes that you'll need. So you don't need any like extra kind of classes, it's just whatever is excess. And this is just to ensure that you know that you're not taking free periods, that you're stimulating your mind and you're preparing yourself for college. Um, this year, because of COVID, uh, we have to change um, our review process a bit. So we are doing a more holistic review. So because of that, we are not actually naming a number for required GPA. We are just saying that if you have a competitive GPA, you have a higher likelihood of getting accepted or you have a higher admissibility. And we are test optional because of uh, the cancellations. Um, in a lot of states, um, you can't even register for classes or for test dates yet. So we are sensitive to, you know, the lack of supply. And so we are going test optional. If you do have test scores, you know, send them into us and we'll, we'll take that into consideration. And it can only help your application. But if you do not have test scores, it will not be counted against you in any way because we, we know um, the situation. Um, a lot of students will ask, you know, what is competitive? Because what is competitive at my school versus my friend's school might be different. And so we will, we use the terms what competitive is. Um, the trick we use is the average GPA for incoming freshmen. So the average GPA for incoming freshman class is about 3.5. So if you're at or above 3.5, you're pretty competitive. Um, you have a very high chance of getting accepted. If you're at 3.5 or maybe a little bit below or just below that, um, that doesn't mean that you won't get accepted. That just means um, that you're not as competitive of an applicant. And then that's when we would recommend submitting some other supplemental documents. These are not required, but they are recommended if you are you know, under that competitive um, GPA range. Some documents that you can submit letters of recommendation, personal statement, um, a resume or a list of accomplishments. So for the letters of recommendation, we do prefer it to come from, you know, an academic. So a teacher, um, if you've taken any college courses while in high school, like an early start or dual program, um, maybe your college instructor or professor, someone that can speak to your academic potential, um, especially if your GPA was a little bit lower, you want to kind of help supplement that academic side. So it should come from someone that can attest to your academic potential. Uh, if you do choose to submit a personal statement, make it related to UH Manoa. So you can explain, you know, why Manoa? Why do you want to come to Manoa? Why do you want to study what you want to study? 
and how can a degree from Manoa help you in that journey, you know? So just tailor it to Manoa, make it as specific as possible, do a little research about what you're interested in. For those of you that are not sure about your major, don't worry, we do have, um, I believe there's six different exploratory pathways. So instead of being undecided, we have exploratory majors. And so um, I encourage you to look into that. Or if you have questions about how to get more information about the exploratory majors, um, you can type it into the Q&A section and then I'll provide the link for you. All right, transfer credits. So a lot of people, a lot of students do take AP courses, a lot of students do, you know, double enroll while in high school. They're also enrolled in some college courses. So if that applies to you, um, perfect. You know, we'll send those transcripts into us and we will do a review process after you're accepted. Um, but you do need to list those courses in your application and you do need to send us those transcripts. Otherwise we won't know. Um, and that also will help some, your application too. So if your GPA was on a little bit of the low side, but you were taking college courses, those will definitely help strengthen your application as well. Um, and then if you are wondering, we do accept fee waivers. They are requests. So you can uh, fill out this request form um, and you would be eligible if you receive free and reduced lunch or if you've ever received a fee waiver for the NACEC, which is the National you know, College Fairs, um, the ACT or the SAT waivers. So if you ever received any of those waivers or if you have the Federal Reduced Lunch Program, um, then you are eligible. So you would uh, download, print the form, sign it, have your high school counselor sign it, and then you can submit it to us. And you can submit it via email and I'll give all the contact info at the end. All right, so for uh, tuition and scholarship information. Okay, so non, my non-resident peeps, um, this would be your tuition. So um, now I will show you a map. So the next page is the list of states, but I just, you know, visual, I'm a visual person, so I want to show you visually. Oh no, my background, <laughs> it doesn't work. Okay, that is fine. Um, so Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, and West, those are WUI states, Western Undergraduate Exchange states. I know I have some California people that um, maybe you registered for this one instead of the WUI one uh, one week from now by mistake. No worries. Um, same information, just, you know, you have a different tuition rate. But everyone, you know, east of that, so from North Dakota, down to Texas, all the way to the East Coast. Those are uh, my non-resident students. And so this would be your tuition here in the column. Oops. Oh no, not, okay, there we go. This would be your tuition here in the column. Um, this tuition rate is to be full-time and this is 12 credits. We recommend students take at least 15 or more so that they can graduate on time. Uh, personally, when I was an undergraduate, I did change my major a few times, and so to catch up uh, so I can graduate on time, I did kind of take um, a lot, so I would range from 16 to 18 credits a semester. Um, I wasn't in anything STEM related, so it was doable. I felt that was a good pace for me. Um, one class is typically three credits, so if you are just full time, you'd only take 12, that's taking four classes. So a lot of students will find that 15 is a good number. Um, so use your first semester to figure out, you know, is 12 good, should I go more? And if you can go more, then it would be like you're taking one or two classes for free because we don't charge anything more after you register for 12 classes. So take advantage of that. Um, so this number does seem large, but here are the two numbers that will remain the same. These are what is included in your tuition. Fees, um, and again, this is for the year. So divide it in half and that's what it is per semester. So about $400 in fees for a semester. These go towards things like, um, you know, athletics is one, um, financing the gym, financing free student tutoring, free transportation to the athletics games, um, you know, it helps offset a lot of costs for the student newspaper for a lot of the free events that we have on campus. So an example is every semester we have like a, it's mostly reggae genre, but we have a music concert on campus at our amphitheater and that is free for students. We have a lot of free workshops like on Valentine's Day, 
Um, usually there's like a fair, there used to be like Build-A-Bear workshop fairs, um, free dance classes. Sometimes there's a free karate or free self-defense classes that they hold in the ballroom. So a lot of these free events, um, that's what your fees pay toward. Um, so those two numbers will remain constant. And then um, 500 a semester on books and supplies, that is pretty heavy. And normally it would be a little bit less than that. But if you are a major in the STEM, um, so biology, science, engineering, um, then you know your first semester, first two semesters, those textbooks can be pretty pricey. Um, so maybe your first year textbooks might be at this price, about 500 a semester, but uh, sophomore year and up, you're getting in more smaller, more focused classes. And so the cost of textbooks would definitely be lower than that. Um, this is an overestimation. Uh, room and board, uh, this is including the most expensive meal plan option. So if it's just the base um, housing and the base meal plan, it is $12,500. Um, and then personal expenses, you know, the, there's a pizza icon here, but your food is included in room and board. So this can be things like if you wanted to fly back um, during Christmas, or other, you know, maybe dorm supplies or a laptop, other things like that. Um, but this is an overestimation. You will not pay more than this figure here. Um, this is just, you know, making sure that you are not under budget, that you don't under allocate things so that you're not short on funds. But there are a lot of different um, scholarships. So about 70% of our students receive financial aid. Um, so I, I encourage you to apply to FAFSA. The FAFSA is now open. I believe they opened yeah, at the beginning of the month of, in October. So definitely submit your FAFSA early. That way, um, you know, you're not getting the leftover in the federal pool that it's not just loans, but you do get scholarships and grants as well if you're eligible for grants. So um, the earlier, the better for application as well as for the FAFSA application. Um, there are a lot of different scholarships too. So um, for example, um, the scholarship that I was saying that you need to be accepted to apply for is actually over 400 different scholarships. Um, you need access into the scholarship database on STAR and you cannot access the database unless you are um, an accepted student and you've made a UH account. So after you've made your UH account, um, you can go into this um, scholarship database and there's over 400 different scholarships. Um, there's more than $9 million in this pool of funds. Oh, sorry, that is my dog. Um, there's over 400 different scholarships. And what's great about STAR is that there's a My Best Fit tab. And so you can click on My Best Fit and it will show you because it's linked to your UH account and knows you know, the GPA that you have, your major, what college you're part of, what state you're coming from, all the information. And the algorithms will spit out a list of scholarships that you personally are eligible for. And then you can apply right there in the database. So it makes it really, really um, easy to apply and really fast too. Some of those scholarships um, are need-based. Some of them are merit-based. Some of them, you just have to be part of this major. Uh, some of them, you just have to be a female. Um, you know, there's a whole bunch of different ones. Um, so I encourage you to look through that and apply for them. Personally, when I was going to college, um, because STAR database has uh, deadlines every semester, so there's one in spring semester, um, February 15, and there's one in fall semester about uh, around October 15. So when I was in college, I would apply each semester to um, the scholarship. So each semester I would get funds for the, the next year, the next semester, and that helped a lot because I didn't have to pay college on my own. Um, so I applied to FAFSA, I got some Pell Grants, I got some scholarships, and the rest I got were loans. And so I continued that uh, for my undergraduate. Um, but at the same time, you know, after accepting all of those funds from FAFSA, I did, you know, fulfill my, um, uh, what is it called? Um, my financial aid was met. I did not owe the school any money because I had a zero balance because of my financial aid. So there's no limit to how many scholarships that you can apply for. So even though, you know, according to the school, I didn't owe anything more, um, I still applied for scholarships. And because it was an excess, I did receive uh, refunds um, and I used that to pay part of my loans while I was in school, 
or I used it to pay um, for the next year so I wouldn't have to take out as many loans, which will really help if you know if you do have to take loans, it would definitely help if you can kind of pay as you go using financial aid, uh, using scholarships that you got, and that kind of can kind of offset this this high price here because um, I do know you know college is um, a worthy investment and it can be pricey, especially coming from out of state. So there are ways to make it more affordable. Okay. So if you're wondering who you can talk to after this presentation, um, after the Q&A section, you know, you go to sleep later and you're like, oh, I have one more question, who can I ask? Um, there are two counselors here. So this is me, I'm Connie, and these are the states that I um, am a counselor for. So uh, mostly um, Northeastern and then Midwest, Central, and then um, Montana, so from Maine to Montana, and then Alaska and Nevada. Um, and then if you are more of like the southern states, so um, about like Florida to Texas, then that would be Justin. So Justin is the other count admissions counselor at Manila that um, does meet and help students that are out of state. And then these are his states down here. This is his email and this is my email. So if you have any questions after this, you know, feel free to contact me. Um, I just took a screenshot from um, our uh, Meet Your Recruiter page, and on that page, you can actually schedule a one-on-one -on -one appointment with any of our admissions counselors, but it is based off of your state. So um, if you don't see your state listed here, then you came to the wrong webinar. You're not a non-resident, but that's fine. We do have a, a counselor for you. Um, you just have to read the recruiter page and make sure that you select the right counselor to make your appointment. Okay, um, and then that is the end of the presentation. So um, earlier I mentioned if you do have, you know, supplemental documents or transcripts or anything else that you couldn't upload into your application because it only allows you to upload three documents, um, you can email them to us. And this would be our uh, main admissions email. Okay, so I'll leave this slide up. And then if there are any questions uh, please put it into the Q&A and not the chat. Uh, someone asked, um, am I just the admissions counselor for a first year or also for transfers? Um, yes, yeah, so incoming student, you know, whether you're a freshman or a transfer, uh, we can help you. So if, if you were in any of the states that were um, me, so I'll go back to this slide here. There we go. So if you're in any of these states, if you're a transfer or a freshman, you know, you can email me. Um, so I answered that one. Um, the link to exploratory majors. Okay, yes. Um, I can get the exploratory majors um, linked to you in just one second. And then another question is, is there a four plus one program for the marine biology? Um, I think you're referencing a program called BAM, bachelors and masters. So for a select number of majors, there is a program where you would enter as a bachelor's um, and you, you would finish in five years and then you would receive your, um, your masters as well. So there are some majors that are like that. Um, marine biology, I don't believe is on that list, but I can double check for you. Um, but to my knowledge, I don't think they are. Um, that's a very popular major though. Um, another question, will the class of 2022, so two years from now, need to have the SAT or ACT? Um, that is a good question. And for now, we are saying, um, Yes, we're going to think that, you know, one year from now when you are a senior and you are applying for college that, you know, COVID has, you know, run its course and finished and that we're all good and healthy and everything kind of goes back to normal. Um, but we are monitoring the, the cases and how it's going nationally as well as locally. So if it is the same and, you know, tests are being canceled or they're not even being offered, you can't register them, then we will make um, changes. But for now, two years from now, we are um, we are leaning towards, yes, um, they will be required, but um, 
make sure to stay updated with our emails. So if you registered for this webinar, that means you received an, an email invite, which means you are on our mailing list. So you'll get any updates to that email. So just you know continue to, to monitor the emails that we send you. Um, does UH recognize the seal of bioliteracy? So um, I wasn't aware that was um, like a test or certificate, but definitely upload that and our admissions officers will um, look at that. Um, if you are looking for back credit, so like for um, your bilingual in another language, it is possible that that seal, that certificate that you have could make you eligible to take a placement exam or get back credit without having to take the placement exam, but it depends on which language because each language department has their own policies of the, how they do placement exam, how they do things. Um, but the fact that you have it is great. Definitely include that in your list of accomplishments that you send to us and um, upload that into your transcript or email that to us as part of your application. Um, and then we can review and then see where that goes. Okay, are there any other questions about <clears throat> um, scholarships, admissions requirements or anything? Okay, we got another question. Let's see. Is there a sailing program at Manila? Um, so program would refer to like um, a course of study, like a major. So there's no major in sailing. There is a sailing uh, team that is one of our teams in athletics um, and they do compete. I believe that's one of our co-ed ones. Um, and then there used to be a sailing um, sailing classes that you can take from the student rec services office, but I'm not sure if that is was discontinued or if it's still being offered. But if you are interested in sailing, um, we do have um, the sports team. So let me um, yeah, let me get back to you about that, Ariane. If you want to chat me, you can um, you can use the chat function and then just say sailing program and give me your email and then I can email you um, the coach's email. Um, if you're interested about like how the recruitment works, I can send you that information. I have the flyer or the brochure in my in my office. Um, next question, are merit scholarships automatically awarded with applications or it is a separate application? Okay, that is a good question. Um, so typically scholarships are not, um, typically you have to apply for scholarships. There is a scholarship that we, the Office of Admissions give out um, that we award to eligible students called the Manoa Academic Merit Scholarship, the MAMS. Um, this year, it is not automatically given. This year, you have to meet certain um, requirements. And then if you're eligible, it is given, um, there's a whole review process for that separately. Um, there are other scholarships that are merit-based. Um, if you're interested in about departmental merit scholarships, those are given case-by-case uh, case by the department and typically not given to freshmen. So let's say you are a sophomore and you're starting your um, second semester sophomore year and you are part of you know, animal science major and that major belongs to CTAR. Um, it's a, the name of a college. And so CTAR will say, you know what? You've had um, really, really solid grades. You know, you've met with me in advising or you've met with your advisors. You know, you, you seem like a dedicated student. Um, your professor recommended you. So here we're giving you a merit scholarship and that's from the department. Um, so those would be typically, you know, um, you would have to be in school and most of the case they are given to already like continuing students. So you just have to, for department merit scholarships, um, just be involved in your department and your major, um, talk with your professors, ask them if they know of any merit scholarships, uh, because a lot of times uh, professors will be um, like email, like, hey, there's you know three spots left for the scholarship, do you know any students? And then if you meet with them often, you might be on the top of their list of students that they think of. So, you know, just things to kind of keep in mind. Um, 
And then some other merit scholarships are given through the FAFSA. So if you submit your FAFSA and you um, put our federal school code on your FAFSA, when you're when after FAFSA is done processing your application, they will send you know your report to our financial aid office. And then the financial aid office will use that number, will use that report to come up with a financial aid package for you using Manoa funds, the pool of scholarships and uh, funds that we have, you know, from the government that they give us for this FAFSA. And so sometimes you might get scholarships. Um, it might be, you know, it might say merit scholarship on there um, or like opportunity grant, but yeah, merit typically is given through departments. So um, merit scholarships through departments don't require applications. Uh, some do, it really just depends on the department. And then some are given through FAFSA, although sometimes they have, they refer to it as like different names. So it might be called merit, but it's technically not merit. So it just, it's kind of different. Good questions. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so um, if there's no questions, I will go ahead and stop share. So if you don't have any other questions, feel free to leave the meeting. Um, you can um, stay on if you do have questions, but if not, feel free to leave. And thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you again in the next Warrior webinar. Have a good night, everyone.